Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by MACF and Florida Makes. I'm your host, Christian Davidson, Director of Marketing for MACF. Today is March 3rd, 2021. I'm very excited to welcome today's speaker, Mark Wilson, who's going to be discussing the state of the business economy in Florida. Mark serves as the President and CEO of the Florida Chamber of Commerce, Florida's largest and most influential business advocacy organization. Mark leads the substantial political, lobbying, grassroots, and economic research operations of the Florida Chamber. The Florida Chamber focuses on making Florida a more competitive market by creating a business climate that generates prosperity and high paying jobs. A few housekeeping notes. As a participant, your audio will be in listen only mode using your phone or computer, whichever is more convenient for you. Additionally, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions using the question window or the chat box. And we ask that you save your questions to the end. We'll go over questions at the end. You may type your questions at any time, but we will save questions till the end. This is a live webinar event and it will be recorded and a link to this recording will be provided to you within a few days. With that, I would like to switch the presentation over to Mark. Mark, okay. take it away. All right, will do. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me uh, go ahead and take care of technology here and make sure that uh, everybody can see what we would want. Um, uh, Christian, can you see the screen there? It looks good. Thanks. All right, fantastic, and all of that. Well, uh, Christian, thank you uh, very much for that introduction. And uh, to everybody on the line today, uh, really looking forward to this conversation. We uh, manufacturing is uh, part and parcel to uh, the success of Florida's future, and we're going to talk a bit about that this morning. And uh, as was indicated earlier, I'm very much looking forward to feedback, uh, to a Q&A period, if you will. And so I hope you'll use that, uh, that chat feature, and uh, Christian will moderate that and let me know uh, as the questions come in. So um, as, a, as really just context for this, obviously we all wish we could be uh, be together uh, literally as opposed to virtually, but uh, for the time being, this is going to have to do. And um, you'll see here on screen, obviously, the Florida Chamber of Commerce has a very close partnership with Florida Makes uh, at the statewide level, and uh, very honored to be asked today to share our perspective with the Manufacturers Association of Central Florida. Um, just by way of background, um, we are uh, the Florida Chamber of Commerce was put together by the business community so that businesses all over Florida would have a voice in Tallahassee and in Washington. And um, we have a fundamental belief that Florida uh, can literally set the stage for what the rest of America can follow. And so whether it's dealing with COVID, whether it's adding jobs, whether it's um, diversifying our economy, we believe the private sector growing is a good thing, and we believe that free enterprise is worth fighting for. And so I just, a little bit of disclaimers right there up on, uh, on the front end. And as I, as I um, hope uh, will become clear throughout our discussion today, anything the Florida Chamber of Commerce can do to help manufacturers or to help the association, uh, we want to do that because, again, Florida's success is in part depended upon the growth and success of, of our manufacturing sector. And I think everybody on the call knows that. We've known it for a long time. We're making tremendous headway with our elected officials uh, over the last few years. And all of our research certainly seems to indicate that, in, that manufacturing is worth investing in, whether that's workforce, uh, whether that's incentives, whether that's uh, infrastructure, and I think that'll become clear in terms of why as we go forward. And again, can't say enough about Florida Makes and Kevin Carr and the whole team there. Uh, we're on this journey together. And over the next 10 years, I think Florida is going to emerge not just as a state that has manufacturing, but I think Florida can emerge as one of the powerhouse states uh, in terms of manufacturing hubs. And I hope to talk through that a little bit. So, um, Think about uh, whatever challenges Florida has, we fundamentally believe can be solved by the business community putting their, their heads together, their dollars together, their muscles together, and their good old-fashioned know-how. And so that's a little bit of uh, the answer to everything we're asked, whether it's workforce issues or 
uh, whether it's, you know, we have a huge legal uh, lawsuit uh, problem in Florida. Um, all of these things can be solved by the business community uniting together. So a little bit of front end there. Um, very big picture to set up this conversation today. Um, our research foundation at the Florida Chamber every 10 years conducts a couple million dollars worth of global research. And what we look at is where can Florida be 10 or 20 years from now? And in order to do that, we have to look at where's the world going to be, where's our hemisphere going to be, and where can Florida be? So uh, don't worry, we're not going to go through uh, this entire report. But, but I do want to start off with this because um, it has to do with sort of our true north in Florida. So uh, we're the only chamber in the United States with a full-time chief economist and a full-time research team. And in a world where we have term-limited politicians, it's important that the business community be the one to maintain this longer-term focus so that we can have this sort of true north, if you will. So here's what the data says. Uh, if Florida was a country, we would be the 17th largest economy in the world. So Florida's economy is bigger than Saudi Arabia, just to put it in perspective. We're at a $1.11 trillion GDP. If you look at the growth of Florida uh, over the last two years, we've our GDP of Florida has grown more than the entire GDP of the state of Mississippi. Uh, just just to put that in perspective, and that's that's just over about a two year period of time. Why does all that matter? Well, why that matters is the research says that if the business community unites together around 39 very specific goals, that we can actually grow Florida's economy over the next decade to be the 10th largest economy in the world, again, by 2030. So if you want to know what the Florida Chamber of Commerce is up to, we are focused like a laser beam on unifying Florida's business community from Pensacola to the Keys around this notion that if we can grow jobs, if we can grow our GDP, if we can grow key industry sectors, that uh, Florida can actually emerge as the national leader and we can become the 10th largest economy in the world. So no small task, but I wanted to say that right up front to give perspective to you know, why are we thinking so big and why are we asking the business community to step up and be part of something much bigger uh, than a company uh, or, or um, you know, or one industry? Uh, so these 39 goals, I'm going to talk about this most of my time today, uh, just one goal, and uh, I'll get to it. One of the 39 goals has to do with manufacturing. It's an industry that we need to grow and we need to support. In fact, it's the only industry that's called out uh, among the 39 goals. And so um, that's why we're interested in this today. That's why we're interested in, in unifying together. A um, couple quick things before I really get into the meat of the program. Um, your association has agreed to work with us. We are in the middle of a massive statewide workforce skills gap analysis right now. Uh, we have about 50 local chambers of commerce throughout Florida that are participating, and we have several dozen associations. And uh, Christian, thank you very much. Your uh, association in Central Florida is going to send out a skills gap survey soon. I think it'll be in your next newsletter. And we're very interested in knowing um, what are your skills needs right now? What do you think they're going to be in the future? Uh, we actually testify tomorrow in the Florida House on a new workforce reorganization bill. And they're asking the business community, you know, what do your members need uh, for skills training and workforce training going forward? So this, this is sort of a live fire exercise. And we need as much real-time intelligence as, as you all are willing to give us. The survey will be anonymous. We won't know who said what, but we absolutely need to know directionally what do manufacturers in Central Florida need in terms of skills gaps, in terms of workforce training. I think everyone on this call knows. Uh, I hope you do. We have the number one rated colleges and universities in the United States, according to U.S. News and World Report. That's, uh, we've been number one for three years. But at the same time, manufacturers all over Florida tell us, you know, we wish we could find more uh, skilled uh, workforce to meet the needs uh, now and in the future. So we have a gap to fill here. We know it and uh, we need your help with it. 
Um, I also want to start off with a little bit of uh, political context uh, or context rather. Um, uh, today's presentation is not political in nature, but I think it's important as employers that we have what I call walking around knowledge to know what are our employees and customers thinking about. And I find this particular poll incredible. This is our poll. The Florida Chamber of Commerce does, uh, does very regular voter polling. We have 14 million registered uh, voters in Florida. Uh, we have more Democrats than Republicans in Florida. Um, but we ask the question, you know, when you think about Governor DeSantis, when you think about the, uh, the Surgeon General, when you think about how has Florida handled COVID, um, I find it incredible that 68% of Republicans think that we've handled COVID just about right. And 68% of Democrats think that it we've, we've not been restrictive enough. And so folks, we've not treated Republicans and Democrats any different. What this slide highlights is how partisan we are as a country, uh, but these are Florida numbers. And so even your own employees would be divided on how we're doing. So for those of you who have remained open, uh, which is most all of you, um, keep in mind, you have some employees who think that you're a rock star and that's fantastic. And you have some employees who are thinking, why are we open again? Again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm saying we're, we're a pretty divided country. And even within an, one employer, you have different perspectives among your employees. And I think it's important that we understand that and, and that we honor that as we keep growing our economy forward. Um, I'm going to skip through these, but um, most of you, I hope, know that the Florida Chamber uh, is the Florida chapter of the National Safety Council. And so when it comes to safety training, uh, our safety trainers, there are certain uh, trainings that we do that only we can do because of our partnership with the National Safety Council. If anyone needs training, obviously, we'd love to talk with you about that. Most of what we do is customized to what individual companies need. Um, we have, uh, just because we're talking to most of you in Central Florida right now, um, the country's biggest safety, health, and sustainability conference is coming to Florida. This is something we run. Uh, this will eventually be thousands of people, but we've decided to go ahead and do an in-person safety and health conference this year. It'll be in May. Uh, it's right there at Disney. And, um, you know, again, if anybody's interested in this, it's pretty easy to find out more information to it. Okay, now to the heart of the program uh, that we want to cover today, and I'm going to go fast, and as Christian said earlier, this entire presentation will be available in a recording format that, uh, that the association will send out, and also my slides will be available. I'll show you how you can get them here in, in, just, uh, in just a few minutes. All right, so very big picture. Uh, let me walk you through kind of what, uh, whoops, hold on a second. Let's go back to um, Christian, what happened there? There we go. All right. Um, very big picture. I think what's important to see here is I mentioned the size of Florida's economy, but let me give you a couple more numbers. Over the next decade, Florida is going to grow by 4 million more people. So we're at 22 million residents right now, and we're going to grow by 4 million more in 10 years. We need you and other job creators in Florida. We need to create 2 million new jobs over the next decade. Um, and look at the job numbers here. If you look back over the last five years in the United States, Florida, you all, Florida job creators, have created one out of every 11 new jobs in the United States for five years in a row. So this goes back to we have to keep Florida, Florida. We have to not let Florida become like New York, Illinois, California, New Jersey. That's going to increasingly be difficult to do because if you look at our growth, we're growing by 900 people a day in Florida, seven days a week. 810 of those 900 uh, on, on any given day, 810 are from another country or from another state. And, and while we love the growth and the economic growth that that brings, we also have people bringing their political views uh, from other states. So the irony is they're escaping New York and California and Illinois and New Jersey and the high regulation and the high tax states. The big question is, how are they going to vote when they get here? And so we have a massive voter education campaign going on to make sure that we all know we need to keep Florida, Florida. And Florida's on the right track. And um, I think 
I probably don't need to say much more about that. But if you if you look over here on the job numbers, I think it's important to know, you know, we have over 300,000 jobs in Florida today that are open that can't find qualified people to fill them. But at the same time, we have over 600,000 people who are looking for jobs, but they can't find jobs that they're qualified for. And so the Florida workforce story is we don't have an unemployment problem uh, per se. What we really have in Florida is a mandate, if you will, to do a better job of skills matching. So, you know, how do we better train and better educate the workforce so that in the future they can show up to work ready to do what you need them to do. So that's a bit about this slide. If you've never heard of the FloridaScorecard.org before, uh, we created it years ago as a way for the business community, our elected leaders, and the media to have one place to go to find out what's going on in Florida, what's going on in our economy. Uh, you actually can visit the FloridaScorecard.org and there's a drop down box. You can look at any county that you want to. Uh, and when it comes to things like childhood poverty or third grade reading scores, you actually can go down to the zip code level to find out you know, how many kids are in poverty in the zip code that you live in or work in. Or you even can mouse over at the FloridaGapMap.org, you can mouse over schools and find out you know, how many kids in each school cannot read uh, at the third grade reading level. And so we, we've created all kinds of very powerful tools uh, in the marketplace for all of us to band together. Again, our future workforce is sort of what this is all about, and it's the reason we invest so much in it. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides, but I think it's important, again, to know what are your employees and customers and friends and neighbors thinking about? And so one big question we ask is, is Florida headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? And, you know, the good news is more voters think Florida's headed in the right direction versus the wrong. Uh, by the way, more voters think the country's headed in the wrong direction versus the right direction. So here's one way that Florida is a bit different than the rest of the country. You can see there are some regional differences, um, big differences between how men and women view this, gigantic differences between how Republicans and Democrats view this. And again, re Republicans think Florida is headed in the right direction. Democrats think it's headed in the wrong direction. Again, same state wildly different views of where we're going. Um, also brown, black, and white, there's differences of opinion there. I'm showing this because the legislature started their 60-day legislative session yesterday. And the Florida Chamber of Commerce is made up of business leaders, again, from every county of Florida, from every industry of Florida. And we're very united about what we think needs to happen in Florida. But when politicians go back home, they're dealing with constituencies that are not united at all. So the only way we're going to win uh, and move Florida forward and keep Florida, Florida, is if we all stay together and make sure that our, uh, our collective impact, if you will, that our 160 members of the legislature are hearing the same thing from the Manufacturing Association, from Florida Makes, from the Florida Chamber, from the local chamber. Uh, it's really our big opportunity, and it's why I wanted to show you that. And then finally, um, before we move on, uh, what are people thinking about in terms of issues? Uh, if you look at this, you know, COVID is the number one answer uh, that voters give right now, 44%, followed by jobs, followed by education, and then healthcare and immigration. Again, nothing needed on this slide. I just want to show you, again, there's regional differences. Uh, there's difference between brown, black, and white, and there's certainly differences uh, all across the board. Um, okay, um, I mentioned earlier the point of the call today is to really focus on, so how can we grow manufacturing uh, in Florida? Remember I mentioned our overall goal is to become the 10th largest economy in the world in 10 years. And right now in Florida, we have just under 400,000 manufacturing jobs. Our goal is to add about 200,000 manufacturing jobs in 10 years. And our overall goal is to be bigger than Illinois in terms of manufacturing jobs. So right now we're the 12th uh, state out of 50 in terms of number of manufacturing jobs. We need to be fifth in 10 years. And so again, uh, I realize it's a moonshot, but what I'd like everybody to be thinking about 
is if you are in charge of this goal, and by the way, Florida Makes is our partner on this goal. So again, thanks to Kevin and the team there. If you are in charge of this goal, what do you as manufacturers need to help Florida meet this goal of adding 200,000 new manufacturers? And again, it could be workforce, it could be infrastructure, it could be investments, it could be a trade policy, it could be a regulatory challenge, it could be a litigation challenge. I want, as the Florida Chamber President, I want to know what the barriers are so that we can collectively go knock them down so that you can grow and we can grow our manufacturing ecosystem here in Florida. Um, in terms of um, a little more in the weeds for all of you, um, we, every few years, we do a massive trade and logistics study. Uh, and this is the issue of where uh, is reshoring happening? Where are the uh, trade gateways, where's trade going over the next 10 to 20 or 30 years. And we believe that more trade for Florida means a uh, much better e economy for Florida. And our research that we've done on this is really changing state policy in many, many ways, but it's real simple. How do we move more through Florida? How do we make more in Florida, which is where you all come in? And then, of course, we multiply the impact. So for every 10 uh, manufacturing jobs that are involved in exports, we actually create about 20 other jobs from everything from logistics to finance to legal uh, warehousing and so forth. And so manufacturing happens to be one of those very special industries where, um, you know, one manufacturing job gets levered to two other jobs uh, that are related. Um, you know, one of the research data points you probably heard that came from us is think about our 15 seaports that we have and think about all of the containers that are coming into Florida on any given day. Generally speaking, um, whether it's trucks or whether it's ships, if you think of every 100 containers that come into Florida full, half of them are leaving empty. And so that's why we need to make more in Florida. The only way we can fill them up when they leave is to make more here and to export more from here. And we've all flown or rented cars one way before. You know, it's much more economical if we have round trips. And so one way we can make Florida more affordable uh, from a trade perspective is to fill up these containers when they leave. And we want to know how can we help you make more uh, how can we help Florida Makes meet this goal of 200,000 more manufacturing jobs? Um, I think most of you know uh, the person on screen, Bill, Le Bill Jurgen, is a leader among leaders. Bill serves on the board of the Florida Chamber of Commerce, and we're so serious about manufacturing that in our January uh, 2021 Economic Outlook and Jobs Summit, we asked Bill if he would share a few words about the future of Florida and the future of manufacturing and what would it take to help diversify and grow jobs. And so I'm gonna, I've got a short video that I'm going to play for you here. And then after Bill's finished, uh, we've actually got some specific manufacturing uh, data and a few legislative items to cover. And then we'll get, uh, won't be too long until we go ahead and get to the Q&A portion. So I'm going to go ahead and play this and, uh, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. I'm Bill Jurgen, and I'm the president and CEO of CorrectCraft. I grew up in South Florida, in West Palm Beach, actually, so I'm a native Floridian, and I love our state. And I'm happy to live here and couldn't imagine living anywhere else. I'm now the president and CEO of CorrectCraft. I live in Orlando. Over the years, uh, we've become the leader in the towboat segment. Towboat segment is uh, boats that uh, pull water skiers, wakeboarders, and wake surfers. And we have three of our company brands that are in the towboat segment. We also have uh, several other company brands, uh, boat brands. We're in the saltwater fishing segment, uh, the bass boat business, the walleye boat business, the uh, cat fishing boat business, aluminum boats, and run around, runabout boats. So we have a lot of different uh, boats and companies that we uh, build boats at. We also have engine and transmission companies. We have three engine brands. Uh, we have a transmission facility, and uh, we have three water parks that are spread across Orlando, Miami. Um, and then one in Orlando, one just outside Orlando. So we're a very interesting company, and we love being in Florida. We couldn't imagine uh, being based anywhere else. We do have operations around the country, about 16 locations, but the bulk of our operations are here in Florida. Florida is a great state to operate in. Uh, you may not know that in Florida there's about 400,000 manufacturing jobs. Florida's a big manufacturing state, and those jobs pay well. 
Those jobs pay about $60,000 a year plus uh, each on average. So those are well-paying uh, production jobs, manufacturing jobs that we provide. You add that all up, and it's about $25 billion of annual uh, payroll that comes from manufacturing into the state of Florida. So manufacturing is a big economic driver in our state. We're about 12th in the nation in manufacturing, uh, but our goal, as you probably know, is by 2030 to be fifth in the nation. Now, the good news is that numbers 1 through 11 are all growing slower than us. We're growing faster than any of them. So we have a reasonable shot, a really good shot, of reaching our goal being top five in the, in the nation by 2030. We make the right decisions in the next few years. If you're interested in tracking these statistics or following this, go to the FloridaScorecard.org. They track uh, where we are, how we're rated, number of jobs we have, average pay, all good information that you might find interesting. So what makes Florida so great? Why is it a great state to have manufacturing? Well, first of all, the climate, right? We all love our climate. We all love being here. We all love our beaches and other natural resources. And other people know about it. It's not a secret, of course. And so they want to be here, too. So I think we've got a, a leg up right away with our climate. Uh, we have low taxes. Florida is known as a low tax state. Everybody loves low taxes, right? And so uh, we have an opportunity to leverage that to bring manufacturing to Florida. And we've got a good regulatory a government uh, climate. Uh, the, we've got regulations, of course, but I believe our state does a good job of trying to manage the regulatory climate to have what we need but not be overly burdensome on the company. And the state has also helped its companies grow. I know our company, the state's helped us grow all around the world and with different, uh, different types of support. So we're thankful for that and glad to be in Florida for that reason, too. But we can be better. What do we need to do? I think of two things in particular. One's related to technology. Uh, computational power is increasing so dramatically, it's going to impact technology in ways we can't even imagine in the next few years. Whether it's artificial technology, uh, robotics, nanotechnology, virtual uh, reality, on and on, technology is going to uh, change dramatically. and It's going to improve dramatically, and it's going to impact our businesses. In fact, I think it's going to impact businesses so much that there's a good number of businesses in Florida that may not be around in 10 years for 2030 if we don't make the right decisions now. At our company, we've set up a special organization that just focuses on dis disruptive technology. It's looking at all the opportunities we have in this area, and we're trying really hard to make the right decisions so that we're around another 100 years. And then this last thing is people and education. When you talk to CEOs around the country and you ask them their number one issue, 90% of them will say the same thing. They'll say finding good people and finding people that can come to work and have an impact. So in Florida, we need to do all the things that we can to continue to educate and develop our employees. We need to teach our students employability skills, things that they need to know to come to work and be productive. We need to teach technical skills and leadership and management skills. So we need to continue to invest in our universities, invest in our trade schools, and invest in our high schools as we look to develop skills, both technical and employability. All right, uh, Christian, thanks for letting me show that. I, again, I think, you know, if you look up in the, in the dictionary, uh, integrity and leadership, you find a picture of Bill Jurgen, and we're so lucky to have him on our board of directors representing a segment of Florida's economy that we're all focused on growing. So um, I have some slides now that talk about the industry, and then I want to talk about legislation and where we're going, and then uh, we'll go right into Q&A. So um, I, our chief economist put a few slides together for all of you today, and this really speaks to the importance of the growth of manufacturing. And so you all know it's important, but if local editorial boards and newspapers and mayors and city councils and county commissions and the 160 men and women that make up the Florida legislature and the 27 members of our congressional delegation, if they don't know the importance of manufacturing to Florida and to their community, then we're really not doing our jobs. And so this partnership with you that we have is really not only about helping each of you, it's also about helping Florida become known as the best place uh, in the hemisphere for manufacturing. And that's, that's no small order. So here we have, as you can see, uh, you know, all the way back over the last 10 years, 
Uh, when you look at the growth of the manufacturing part of Florida's GDP, it's been almost 60% over the last decade. Uh, we've given you a county by county look at this. And so I know most of you are in central Florida. Maybe you have operations elsewhere. Maybe you have peers and suppliers in other counties. Uh, this is a county by county look at what's been happening. There are some counties that have lost manufacturing, but for the most part, uh, Florida has been on absolute fire and we certainly need more of it. Um, in terms of the, again, the county by county look at new jobs um, that have been added um, and current jobs, I should say, in manufacturing, here's a county by county look at it. If you just look at the four counties that, um, that, that primarily make up your association, there's almost 50,000 current jobs uh, in the four county region right now that, uh, that are manufacturing jobs, Lake Orange, Osceola, and Seminole. Um, and you can also see there the, the share of jobs. So in Lake County, 4.2% of all the jobs in the county are manufacturing. Orange is 4.5, Osceola, you can read the numbers yourself. Um, green means the number's increasing. So that's where we would want to go. Uh, Seminole, even though you're at 4.1%, uh, that's a fewer percentage of jobs uh, than a year ago. Uh, and so we want all these numbers to be green. We want to grow the top line numbers because this is a bit of, uh, you know, Bill Jurgen talked about computational power. Um, and, you know, really this is an algebra exercise. If we want that top left number uh, to be 600,000, then we need the top numbers in all four counties to grow uh, as well. Um, we also took a look at what about wages, right? So manufacturing pays well above average wages in just about every market, um, but you can look at the manufacturing average wage by, uh, by county here as well. Lots of data here. We don't need to go through all of this, uh, but nonetheless, this is incredibly important. As Bill Jurgen mentioned statewide manufacturing wages are, are over $60,000 a year, and that's well uh, above the state average. Um, we also uh, added, just, just because we had you all on the call today, uh, I, I had our chief economist add for you, you know, the two counties to your east, Volusia and Brevard, of course, with the Space Coast. And you know, look what happens to the region when you add those two, right? O over 85,000 manufacturing jobs by any stretch of the imagination. You, you are all a manufacturing powerhouse in central Florida, as is South Florida in the Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale and uh, Palm Beach areas as well. Um, here's another perspective that I think is very important. I mentioned before, Florida has about 22 million people. Um, by the way, we have more people than New York, but New York's state budget is twice the Florida budget. So think about that. About the same number of people, their state budget is twice. It's one reason so many people are leaving New York headed for Florida. Um, but here's a look at where the next 4 million people are going to live. And again, we've given you a county by county perspective here. Um, uh, companies uh, like banks, uh, major retailers, major distributors are looking at these numbers because, you know, this is the old Wayne Gretzky skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it is. And again, you can look all this up later. Happy to answer any questions on it if anybody wants to have a, uh, an offline conversation about where we see population in 10 years. Um, because we're the only uh, state chamber with a chief economist, I, you know, we have a lot of access to what's going on in the economy. And um, what I wanted to show you here is Florida lost about 1.1 million jobs since last April. So uh, yesterday was the one year anniversary of Florida's first confirmed case of COVID. Um, and by April of last year, uh, again, we lost 1.1 million jobs in Florida. Now, the good news is we've brought back about 700,000 of them. I'm going to show you in a minute the breakdown. There's still 419,000 fewer jobs today than we had uh, last March. I'm going to show you uh, how those are coming back in just a minute. Notice the numbers on the bottom right here. Uh, we've made an official forecast for Florida for 2021, and we believe we're going to add just under 300,000 residents and about 280,000 new jobs 
Um, we're estimating that Florida will be back um, to pre-COVID level, levels uh, by next summer. Um, the tourism industry, unfortunately, won't be back to pre-COVID levels, in our estimation anyway, until the summer of 2023. Uh, but nonetheless, Florida's economy's come back strong, and certain sectors are actually in better shape uh, than they were before uh, we went into the pandemic. Um, here's a bit of that look that I just talked about. So we're down 419,000 jobs compared uh, year over year, if you will. About half of them are in the hospitality and leisure industry. Look at manufacturing. Uh, you're almost back uh, to where you were. Uh, and, I, and this is just a great thing. It also speaks to how diversified Florida's economy is. Most people think that, that Florida pays low wages. Not true. And most people think that Florida's economy is all tourism, agriculture, and construction. Also not true. While those three industries are incredibly important, and they always will be, we've been diversifying our economy for the last 25 years in ways that most people you know, don't understand. And so right now today, if you take all 50 states, Florida has the 20th most diverse economy in the United States. And by, by double downing or doubling down on uh, manufacturing with Florida Makes and the Florida Chamber, uh, we're going to continue to diversify our economy. We need to be the 12th most diverse economy by 2030. And again, manufacturing helps with that in a big way. Uh, most people think of Orlando and they think of this awesome company known as Disney, uh, and that's great. Uh, what most people don't know is if you think of modeling and simulation, the Orlando market is actually the global capital or the global hub of all things modeling and simulation. It's actually a $5 billion industry in Central Florida alone, and it's literally the global hub of modeling and simulation. So um, part of our job is to get the word out that you know we're not the same Florida that we, we were 30 years ago, and a um, lot to talk about there. Um, I talked about year-over-year -year job changes. You can look this up later, but this is a county-by-county Look, most every county has fewer jobs in it than it had a year ago. Some are on the brink of just uh, just uh, fighting back to break even. But nonetheless, this is a, a county by county. Look at that. Um, also, folks, another sobering uh, note here, and this is directly related to COVID. So we're down 419,000 jobs on the year over year. Uh, but I think what's important to notice here is see that number minus 276,000. We've actually had over 275,000 people in Florida leave the workforce. In other words, they left work. They're no longer looking for a job. So they're not even counted in the unemployment numbers. What's sobering about this is most of these numbers are women who have had no choice but to stay home because maybe their childcare facility is closed, or maybe their school was closed, or maybe their caregiver is no longer available. And so we have a major league disruption going on in the workforce right now. And I don't have to tell any of you, uh, whether it's a mom or a dad or two parent or one parent or a single dad or a single mom, whatever configuration you wanna talk about, if there's nowhere for the kids to go, uh, that's a quality place, that's an affordable place, it's going to have an impact, an impact on workforce productivity. Uh, we're actually in the market right now doing a, a, a second study, a COVID impact study that we'll have the results of in June. One of the challenges, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this right now, but you know, Florida has uh, America's first $15 an hour wage mandate, and that kicks in over the next couple of years. One industry that's going to really take it uh, hard is the childcare industry. So think about daycare facilities, think about early learning facilities. When they have to pay $15 an hour, many of them have already told us they will close. The ones that will remain open are going to have to charge more. And so for those of you who have employee base that relies on people taking care of their kids during the day, uh, you'd be very wise to start thinking about how you're going to handle that on a go forward basis. Uh, this is a this is a global problem, not just an American problem, uh, but it's especially acute here in Florida because we really have to figure out how we're going to solve this uh, in the coming months, not the coming years. So stay tuned on that. 
Um, I mentioned the legislative session that we literally just started yesterday. The, the governor launched uh, the state of the state yesterday. Uh, our business is to work very closely with the House and Senate, as you can imagine. Um, as a result of the last elections in the fall, I know most people talked about the presidential election, but there were quite a few Florida elections. The, the Florida House and the Florida Senate got slightly more Republican than they were before, and they're already dominated by Republican leaders. Um, but there's already quite a bit of activity. We've had almost 3,000 bills filed for the Florida legislative session this year. Um, about 250 will probably pass. In my experience, that's, that's about where we end up. Uh, our team's already testified over 30 times, and uh, we're really just getting started. There's a lot of effort underway on, on reconfiguring Florida's workforce system. So my team, we have 35 lobbyists on our team, and uh, every single one of them are, are working on one version of a workforce rewrite or another. So again, that survey that uh, is gonna be sent out in your newsletter, you'd, you'd be doing yourself and us a big favor by giving us perspective on what do you need the legislature to either start doing or stop doing. In terms of our overall legislative agenda, again, it's tied to our 2030 blueprint and it's all about growing the private sector. What you're looking at here are pictures of what the capital in Florida looks like on any given day. And for those of you who've been in this process for a long time, the obvious point here is the Capitol is generally closed to outside visitors unless, unless you have a special invitation. And so if ever you were going to call your legislators or email or text or you know, go, go into your office today and send a video message to your senator and your house members about issues that really matter to you, Folks, this is the year to do that. Um, they're not, they don't have thousands of people coming to visit them. They don't have 12 people in their waiting room coming in to see them. They literally, they're, when, they're in a bubble, and the only way they can hear uh, what's actually going on back home is if you call them, email them, text them. Uh, my, my favorite would be, you know, go out on the floor and put a short video together, a two- or three-minute video, and let them know what your most important issues are and how if, if we're going to add manufacturing jobs in Florida, here are the kinds of things that they need to be doing. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of doing that right now. Um, again, there will there's be about 3,000, probably 3,500 bills filed when it's all said and done. A couple of things I wanted to highlight here, um, you know, economic development and specifically giving employers um, a qualified incentive to add jobs and add capital is something that's really important here in Florida. Every other country does this, most other states do this, and we need to be able to compete with other states when incentives matter. In terms of, uh, of lawsuit abuse, um, I'll talk about that in a moment, but specifically COVID liability protections. You know, many of you have put your life savings on the line to stay in business and to keep your employees and your customers and your vendors safe. If you think about the billboard trial lawyer industry that we have in Florida, Florida has the fifth worst legal climate in the United States. It's, it's one of those things we absolutely have to fix. Drive around Florida or turn on the radio or turn on TV and you know Florida has more billboards encouraging you to sue somebody than any other country on the planet or any other state in America. And it's really unacceptable. And we're doing everything we can in the elections process and the policy process to fix it. But in the meantime, you've probably noticed you're starting to see ads encouraging your employees that if they get COVID to sue their employers. We've even seen other states and we're not gonna let this happen in Florida, not, not while I'm here, but we've seen other states actually have a presumption that if you get COVID, you must have got it at work. It's therefore then a workers' compensation case. Some of you may have seen, uh, there's been some high profile cases in the media uh, where someone got sick that worked for a large retailer. Uh, they now have gone back and are essentially filing wrongful death against the retailer and the judge refused to, to, to uh, throw it out. So this is real stuff. It's a, it's a heyday and a payday for these billboard trial lawyers. It's unconscionable to think that as you all were keeping your companies open, 
that the trial lawyer industry wants to come after you and blame you uh, anytime somebody gets sick from COVID. Uh, I don't have to tell you the OSHA implications on this, but the, the Florida lawsuit abuse implications are, are big. Um, we have uh, several bills moving in the legislature. Uh, could, uh, can't thank Governor DeSantis enough. He actually talked about this just recently in some of his public comments that we have to protect local businesses from uh, from these frivolous lawsuits. And it, it's become one of our number one priorities this session. And you have my word, we're going to do everything we can to protect you on that. Uh, research and development, I don't think I have to tell you the importance of, of Florida becoming a national research and development powerhouse. And we have legislation on that. We talked about economic development. We've talked about workforce quite a bit. Um, and also on infrastructure, Congress will pass an infrastructure package um, unfortunately, Florida has uh, invested record numbers over the last five years in infrastructure, and uh, that's a good thing. We have some of the safest roads and bridges in the United States, but with four million more people moving to Florida over the next decade, and by the way, 50, 5 zero, 50 million more annual visitors will be in Florida in 2030 than were in Florida in 2018. 50 million more. So our roads, our bridges, our ports, our spaceports, our airports, uh, and so forth, they need to be top notch. Most other states have not kept their infrastructure up to speed anywhere near what Florida has. So the federal concern we have is will Florida be a donor state? Will we be sending money to Washington so they can send it to other states that have not been as responsible as we have? But the Florida legislature, we're asking them to invest even more in uh, in infrastructure. Think of interchanges in rural parts of Florida. Think of broadband technology that will allow you to operate businesses in parts of Florida uh, where you haven't been able to before. So um, I'll, I'll move off of this, but needless to say, we're on day two of a 60-day legislative session, and we need all the help we can get. I mentioned lawsuit abuse reform. We couldn't ask for a better partner than Governor DeSantis on this. Um, again, Florida ranks 46th out of 50. We have the fifth worst legal climate in the United States. The average family of four in Florida pays over $4,000 a year uh, in higher costs for everything from toothpastes to cars to haircuts, all because of that. Um, whoops, let me go back to, uh, let me go back to uh, where we were. Thanks. Um, in terms of what voters think about this, uh, remember the COVID liability piece I talked about? So uh, about 75% of voters think that the legislature should protect you from these frivolous COVID liability suits. I can assure you all 160 members of the legislature have received this from us, uh, but feel free to send it to them as well so that they know that this matters to you, uh, to your vendors, to your family. Um, we don't need to go through the details of any of these bills unless you want to, but again, there's a couple bills. One focuses on all of you. Uh, there's another bill that also adds in the healthcare industry. It, again, it's unconscionable to think that these nurses and physicians and assistants that have been working in hospitals and doctor's offices, they should be protected. They literally ran in, they put their own lives on the line to, to help all of us. And the trial lawyers in Florida don't think that they should be protected uh, from COVID protections. It's just, it's insane, but it's the political process. So that's another fight that we're in the middle of right now. So uh, Christian, if, if it's all right with you, I know I've covered a lot uh, of ground. Um, and let me, let me end by where we started, which is, you know, manufacturing. If, if we could buy stock in Florida, I would be buying as much of it as I could afford. And if Florida was a mutual fund, you know, we'd be putting as much into our manufacturing sector as we possibly could. It needs to be championed, supported, and grown. And what we need most is for those of you who are leaders in the industry to talk with us about what do we need in Central Florida, what do we need in Florida, so that we not only can uh, make sure we're moving it forward in the legislature, but we need to make sure that the word gets out to, you know, think of kids who are in middle school and high school uh, they don't know that manufacturing jobs are awesome. They don't know what they pay. They don't know how meaningful they are. They don't know how safe they are. And they darn sure don't know that they're available uh, right here in Central Florida. So um, anxious to take any questions that you might have. But Christian, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you sort of guide and moderate where we go from here. 
Thank you, Mark. Yes, you covered a lot of ground and a lot of interesting insight in today's presentation. Uh, we will be taking questions now. Please use the question window or the chat box, either one. I'm going to monitor those. So go ahead and send your questions in. Um, we'll start off here. Uh, Mark, how do you see the growth in Florida over the next few years impacting the cost of living here in Florida? Yeah, it's a really great question, and it's a double-edged sword, right? So um, I think we all learned a long time ago in economics, you know, supply and demand is is real, right? So um, if you look at what's happening right now to home prices, for example, uh, they're going up dramatically in Florida. Uh, and in many ways, that's because people want to live here. They're relocating here. As I mentioned earlier, we're adding 900 people a day. Places like New York and California and Illinois are losing populations. And so, um, in fact, if, if you want to move from New York to Florida, one of the challenges is, you know, house prices are going up in Florida. House prices are going down in New York. So you're, you're kind of squeezed both ways. But let me speak specifically to the biggest concern that we have. Um, you're talking about cost of living. Um, two things. One, workforce housing. Uh, before COVID started was one of our number one problems in Florida. So, um, you know, if you want to work for a manufacturer or if you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, if you're a firefighter, if you're in law enforcement, first responder, um, you want to live in Florida, but you can't afford, um, you know, housing within 30 or 40 minutes of where you work. And unfortunately, this is a, this is real for many parts of Florida. So, we have a massive, massive effort underway on the housing um, issue, um, and that's, that's its own issue. In terms of cost of living, there's much that the legislature can do to bring down the cost of living and the cost of doing business in Florida. And again, uh, things like lawsuit abuse are things the legislature can do that bring down the cost of living. You know, everybody in the media wants to talk about businesses should be forced to pay more money. Well, if the goal is to have employees take home more, as we all know as business leaders, and, you know, I have 45 employees here, so we deal with this every day. There's two sides to that equation, right? Uh, one is to pay more. One is to drive down the cost of living and the cost of doing business. And so, um, for example, on auto insurance, Florida has the second highest auto insurance rates in the United States. And it's not because we have more accidents. It's because we have more lawsuits. And uh, the legislature is addressing that this session. If you look at what local businesses pay to rent uh, either office space or a, man a, a facility to manufacture in, if you will, if you don't own your space, Florida is the only state in the country that charges businesses a sales tax on the rent that you pay to rent your space. And so, you know, we all think that everything in Florida is perfect, but our litigation system and the way we tax businesses in certain areas uh, are actually adding costs to the cost of doing business and the cost of living because, of course, all of you have to pass those costs on to your customers. That makes you less competitive and it makes it more expensive to live in Florida. So um, I wish I could tell you that the cost of living and the cost of business is going down. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, if you think back to a half hour ago when I was talking about these containers that come into Florida, either on ships or on trucks or on trains, you know, for every 100 that comes into Florida full, um, they're leaving, you know, only half of them are leaving full. So one way we can drive down the cost is to fill them up when they leave. And again, it all sort of creates this virtuous cycle uh, that drives down costs and drives up sort of Florida's competitiveness. So uh, I hope that helps a little bit. But uh, again, 22 million people going to 26 million people over the next few years, 10 years. You know, thank goodness we, we do not have a personal income tax in Florida. Um, but again, uh, taxes are generated by economic activity and transactions. And so one way we can drive down costs is to drive up economic activity and, again, grow the private sector. So if there are specific questions on that, I'd be happy to, you know, either get those in an email or, or address those later on. And if anybody has ideas 
of, you know, we certainly do not support government mandates. Um, you know, if the government came out and started mandating what, you know, uh, how we have to reduce costs and so forth, then businesses would just leave Florida. That's what that's what places, you know, that's what other countries like France do. And that's what other states like California and Illinois and New York do. And we're not going to have that here. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next question is obviously a lot of the way we do business has changed in a COVID world. What are some of the trends that you see sticking around for the long haul post COVID? And how do you think that'll affect the manufacturing industry? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it can be a net winner for manufacturing. We we actually started getting this question uh, almost nine months ago. Um, you know, we've done over, we've hosted over 60 Zoom calls with over 20,000 people in that time frame, and this question comes up on every call. So let me take a couple of things that are here to stay. Um, so uh, the use of technology. So for example, think about telemedicine. Um, the Florida Chamber passed legislation two years ago to dramatically accelerate the use in Florida of telemedicine. Oddly enough, the, the doctors are the ones who opposed it uh, because it, it really upset their funding model. And the fact that you could have any doctor help you out was not something that supported the old, the old model. But nevertheless, think about in the COVID environment, we had millions of people who visited their doctor for the first time uh, via technology. And now what's, and by the way, talk about a generational shift, an entire generation just visited their doctor over the last year uh, electronically. And what we now have is an entire generation who are saying, you know what? I'm never gonna go back to the doctor's office again if I can help it. There's no reason this telemedicine thing works. I love it. And it's now becoming the preferred choice of how to access your doctor. So, you know, if you need to see your doctor and, and she has office hours, most people are now preferring to see their doctor via telemedicine. So that's here to stay. Um, another giant one that's going to impact all of you is the reshoring uh, of the supply chains. And so, again, we, we were working with McKinsey on this almost a year ago. As soon as COVID happened, uh, as soon as we started seeing shortages of, uh, you know, everything from ibuprofen to brake parts, uh, we started thinking, wait, you know, we have a huge trade and logistics play in Florida. We need to add manufacturing jobs. What can Florida do to reposition itself as the receiver of, you know, as we start reshoring supply chains and reshoring manufacturing jobs, what do we need to do to make Florida to be the big winner? So, um, you know, that's a big part of our legislative agenda this year. It's a big part of what we've been working with Florida Makes on. And we just announced a massive several hundred thousand dollar research initiative, uh, which is called, uh, it'll be called our Trade and Logistics 2030 Report. Florida makes is a big part of this. And the question that we're researching this year is as the as global trade patterns and supply chains and manufacturing changes over the next decade, really as a result of COVID, uh, not only the result of shipping lanes and things like that, how can Florida be the big net winner? So in December of this year at our annual transportation and logistics summit, we'll be unveiling the results of this massive new trade and logistics study. So um, restoring is here to stay. Um, I don't think it mattered which administration was gonna win in DC. The American people want this, and it's a big opportunity for Florida to be a net winner. The, the last one I'll mention has to do with rural uh, growth. And so I think as, as many people know, um, you know, being rural in Florida is not the same as being rural in Kansas or rural in Texas. You know, there's nowhere in Florida that's more than 60 miles from a major metropolitan area. Uh, and so being rural in Florida is almost like being in the suburbs of, of most states. I say that to say this, we have nearly 30 counties that are designated rural. And one of our goals by 2030 is to double the percentage of Florida's GDP that comes from rural Florida. So here's what's happening. One of the challenges that you have as manufacturers, if you were going to move a facility to rural Florida, 
Um, many places in rural Florida have great infrastructure. They're, they're close to highways. They're close to rail. They don't have the one thing you need most, which is a workforce. And so now what's happening is talk to any realtor that sells real estate in rural Florida, and they will tell you they're literally on fire. Companies and families are moving from up north and other parts of Florida to rural Florida. We actually have people leaving Miami and Tampa and Fort Lauderdale and Jacksonville. They're moving away from the metropolitan areas and they're moving their families to rural Florida. So we're running into two challenges with that. One is broadband communication. So you're going to see a massive push to immediately make broadband coverage available statewide, especially in rural areas. You know, it's hard to go to school um, virtually and it's hard to work if you don't have really good access, internet connectivity and so forth. The second thing that's happening and where I'm really going with this is families are moving to rural Florida. And that means it's not just uh, mom and dad, but it's two or three kids. And oftentimes those kids are working age. And so we're literally importing talent into rural parts of Florida right now that we're not going to have that talent. So uh, those are the three really big trends that we see um, that I don't think are gonna go away. I suppose a fourth one that's debatable is, you know, we've had a lot of companies um, say that, you know, they're never gonna go back into an office environment again. Um, I, you know, it, it remains to be seen if that's a permanent decision or not. But for example, Nationwide Insurance had, I believe seven offices in Florida uh, they sent all their people home, put up their buildings for sale and said, we're never going back into the office. You know, jobs that can be done remote are permanently going to be remote. So that'll certainly be a disruption in the next five years. Uh, we have an awful lot of office buildings that, you know, don't have high occupancy right now. So that's a major disruption and a challenge. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of rents and mortgages uh, that are never going to get paid. Uh, but nonetheless, I think those are the three big trends that are here to stay. Great insight, Mark. Uh, next is, you know, you're privy to a lot of the conversations that go on up in Tallahassee regarding education. And there's uh, there's been so much focus lately on technical education. And we talked about workforce skills gaps and shortages. Uh, do you can see a continuing trend towards pushing technical education uh, versus some of the other forms of education? And how do you see Tallahassee responding um, and continuing to, uh, to support technical education for manufacturing? Yeah, thanks for that. That's just a, that's a really astute question. And let me, let me say it this way. We have 28 state colleges, right? Um, the community college network, if you will. We have 12 public universities. We have over 30 private colleges and universities. And then we have this awesome network of technical schools all over Florida. Um, let me say it this way. Um, we believe at the Florida Chamber that if you look at the fact that we need to add 2 million new jobs over the next decade, um, and again, we, one thing I'm working on right after this presentation today is I mentioned we're in the field right now doing a workforce study and you all are going to help participate in that. Um, I just got to look at where we are so far on numbers. And let me answer it this way. 78% of businesses tell us they expect to hire in Florida over the next year. Only 11% do not. But here's a number that I'll begin to answer your question. We ask, generally speaking, when you hire new employees in Florida, are they ready to work or do they need additional skills training? And again, the live number that just came in, you know, about 45 minutes or an hour ago uh, is 47 percent uh, have said people are ready to work when we hire them. But in Florida, 53 percent of people you hire need additional skills training. And so when we when we talk about technical education. Um, part of my day at 6.30 this morning, my first phone call uh, at 6.30 was uh, with a few people who wanted to talk about the various bills making their way in the legislature this year that have to do with workforce and technical training. All of you have heard the, the words bright futures before, 
And there's a big push that we support, by the way, you know, how do we align tax dollars that are going into education and training, whether it's technical training, uh, management training, et cetera, how do we align our workforce and talent dollars with what the future needs of Florida's economy is going to be? And nobody can argue against that. Um, having said that, the most talked about bill in the legislature so far, at least on social media, is the Senate president uh, would like to change the way that we do uh, workforce funding and br specifically bright futures. And his idea, uh, you can read about it in the media if you want to, his idea is let's take the in-demand jobs that we know Florida is going to have over the next decade. So think about manufacturing as an example, clearly in demand, clearly we have a, work a workforce skills challenge and essentially reallocating uh, things like bright futures into those degrees that are going to be most in demand in Florida. Um, and of course, the immediate pushback is, you know, if, if someone wants to get a degree in something that, you know, if, if there's no jobs in that degree, you know, the pushback is that student ought to be able to get whatever degree they want to. And of course, that's true in the United States. The question is, should taxpayers, through the Bright Futures piece, should taxpayers be using taxpayer dollars to fund any degree, whether it's from a technical school, university, college, what have you, or should taxpayer dollars be used to fund degrees that Florida actually, you know, where they're, they're in demand for segments of the economy that we're growing? Um, it's going to be one heck of a fight. It's already taking place in social media. Um, our argument for the last 20 years has been Florida needs to have one of the 12th most diverse economies in the United States. And the only way you do that is to have the number one workforce in the United States. And the definition of the number one workforce is, isn't what percentage of your electorate or citizenry has degrees or anything. It's have we matched the needed skills that employers have with the skills that potential employees have? I mean, that's the perfect fit that we're looking for. And so I'm sorry for the long answer, but you, you've really touched on what's going to be one of the most controversial issues uh, of the legislative session. And as we talk about transformation, um, the state colleges, the 28 state colleges, um, represent a very specific geography. So for example, Seminole State College, as you can imagine, represents one county. Uh, Valencia has multiple counties. Um, the question becomes, you know, how do we uh, put technical schools together with colleges, together with universities, and not go backwards? And I, I would just, I would remind you what I said earlier, U.S. News and World Report for three years in a row has said Florida's colleges and universities are the number one rated in the United States. So the, the question becomes, how do we not ruin that? You know, how do we add to that? And, you know, Florida has not been known nationally or internationally as a place that has, you know, some of the best technical skills in the workforce. And we just we need to change that. We need to change that, you know, uh, overnight as much as we can. So. I hope that gives a little bit of context to that, but you've really touched on what's quickly becoming one of the more controversial issues of the legislative session. And I, I liken it to at, at all of your workplaces, there are things that your company needs to do. Maybe you need to change a process, or maybe you're gonna shut down the production of something uh, in favor of, of, of a new product that you're going to start supporting. It's usually not popular with the people uh, that uh, that are working on that. And so, you know, hard things are really never popular. And I think that as we realign our, our workforce to what the outcomes need to be, I think we're going to have a lot of short-term arguing going on. Um, and so, again, this could be one of those issues where if you feel strongly about technical education and you feel strongly about what's needed, um, you know, maybe you have a phenomenal partnership with your local college or a phenomenal partnership with your local technical school. Make sure your House and Senate members know that. Um, how else would they know how it works at ground level? And how else would they know what your needs are if, if they don't hear directly from you? So I hope that helps. 
Yeah, Mark, you touched on something really important to us, and that is working side by side with our, our technical institutions and our manufacturers to promote high wage careers in manufacturing. I kind of have a follow up to that, though, and I think it comes with educating businesses as well as, you know, we push that not every child needs to go to a four year university to have a successful career, especially in manufacturing. And yet when you go to fill out um, applications or you look at this uh, job descriptions online, a lot of them still ask for a four year degree or higher. Um, right. How do we educate, do you think, our businesses that, you know, to maybe have less focus on the college and university education and maybe focus a lot more on our technical education? Yeah, I, th I think it's one of the really big challenges that we have in, in America. This is not just a Florida problem, but, um, you know, a couple things. In Germany, and uh, many of you know this, you know, if, if you come home and tell mom and dad that you want to be a diesel mechanic, um, you know, you get high-fived and hugged just like in the United States if you come home and say, I want to be a doctor. And so part of what we have to do uh, in Florida is we have to talk about the value of work. And, you know, we, we have to really rebrand Florida as for people who want to work, Florida is going to be the best place on the planet. And, you know, by the way, you know, there's a lot of awesome jobs in Florida. Think about it. Manufacturers pay well above uh, the state average on wages. And these are phenomenal jobs, meaningful jobs. The problem is people don't know about them. And, you know, not, not to get too personal here, but in my own example, you know, as president of the Florida Chamber, I arguably have access to information that most people don't have. And in my own family, I can remember talking to my middle son, Matthew, years ago about, you know, there's no reason to pursue a four-year degree. He has a huge interest on the technical side. And we started talking about technical schools and two-year colleges and, and the six-figure opportunities that exist. And even in my own family, with all the resources I have access to, it, it took a long time uh, because my son would always say, no, all my friends, you know, are doing the four-year thing. I got to get the university degree. And it taught me on the front row that we have completely failed an entire generation of our workforce by, by telling them that a four-year degree is success and anything less is not. I think our answer to this question really lies in the early years. And, you know, if you think of like third grade, for example, 58% of our third graders in Florida can read at grade level. And our goal is that it's 100%. But if you think about the early years and you think about middle school, um, you know, how can we start educating parents, guidance counselors, and, and frankly, teachers and kids, how can we start educating them in middle school and high school that there are some phenomenal career opportunities uh, that do not require uh, four year. Some don't even require two year. Um, I think it's the business communities to win. And I'll I'll end the question by by just giving you an example I gave the legislature and and one that I gave the Wall Street Journal when they asked me the same question. And I I said, look, if I take everybody that's on this call, uh, if I take all of you out to dinner tonight, and we just show up at a restaurant somewhere, and I say, hey, just make us something good here's what would happen. Let's suppose there's 50 of us at dinner tonight. Um, 49 of you would send it back because, you know, the chef didn't know you were allergic uh, to that, or the chef didn't know you wanted it medium well. And you would all be looking at me saying, this is the worst restaurant we've ever been to. Let's never come back here again. Folks, that's what we in the business community have been doing with our colleges, our technical schools, and our universities, when we assume they're going to give us something that we need. And so, again, it, it might be hard to hear, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I think rather than waiting on the legislature or even waiting on certain schools, I think one thing we can do at the association level, at the company level, at the community level, is we can get really serious about what exactly are we going to need in terms of, of skills, in terms of uh, job capabilities, and then how can we collectively, through our associations, through working with these institutions, how can we 
uh, start being better over the next one, two, five, ten years at being very clear about the jobs that are going to be available and the skill sets and the occupations that are going to be available, as well as the training and skills that are needed. And where do you go to get them? Right. And so um, I, I could give you, you know, 10 days of stories about this, but you, you're you're absolutely on to the right question. Um, we have asked local newspapers. We've asked local radio hosts. Uh, we've asked uh, local county commissions and school boards to all start posting, you know, how many jobs um, are going to be created in this county over the next 10 years. What industries are they going to be in? How much do they pay? How in demand are they going to be? Uh, what schooling and training is going to be needed? And where do I go to get that locally? Um, and if you think about it, um, you know, that stuff, you would think it's easy to find. It's not. And in June, we're going to be unveiling the results of our, uh, of our workforce skills study that we're asking all of you to help us on right now. And one thing we're going to be doing is breaking down by region in Florida, by MSA, I should say, uh, what are the current and future skills uh, that are needed as far as eight years out. And so later in the year, when June rolls around, we'll have a little bit better intel and we'll be working directly with Florida Makes on this. And uh, by the end of the year, we ought to have a regional snapshot um, and we'll be working with the legislature, of course, because the ultimate goal is to align uh, future funding and future uh, talent development with what the needs of the private sector are going to be. Um, sounds like a simple concept. Uh, it's, it's certainly not, but you have my word that uh, that's what we're focused on. Thanks, Mark. Anything and, else? And yeah. In the interest of time, we'll take one more question and then Obviously, any questions from there, we can direct them uh, to Mark at a later time. But um, you brought up an interesting point uh, about people moving into Florida, but continuing to vote the way that they voted previously that maybe made their state an undesirable place to do business. How do you feel that we can, one, uh, educate voters better once they've moved into the state to make sure that we keep Florida's business climate the way it is, uh, especially when we intend to grow. And then two, you know, Florida sometimes has a black eye as far as, you know, around the nation, everyone looks down to Florida, you know, Florida man and this and that. And how do we change that perception so people know that Florida is a viable place to live and work um, and that we we do intend to grow to be a, a top five uh, economy. Yeah. yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating question. So the good news is the, the Florida Chamber of Commerce is in the middle of a five-year, uh, very, very big strategic plan about, you know, how to, if, we're, if we're focused on becoming the 10th largest economy in the world, what are the things we have to do in the business community to, to get that right? One thing that we really have to come to terms with is, you know, the brand or the image of Florida. And this is I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but we're in the middle of a 18 month research project right now. Uh, we're studying what do people think of Florida and what, what do we want them to think of Florida? So for example, uh, everything you just said, Florida man, you know, um, you know, by the way, we have, you know, 4.5 million residents are seniors in Florida. 21% of our population are seniors. And, uh, most people don't know, we have more Hispanic and Latino uh, residents of Florida than we have seniors. But people don't think of Florida as a diversified place. They think of a place that has seniors. People think of Florida as a place that does not have a good education system. We have a top 10 K-12 system in the United States and the number one rated uh, college and university system in the country. Uh, people think of Florida as tourism and construction. And, and while that's certainly important and true, Florida has the 20th most diverse economy in, in the United States. So the point there is, on one hand, those of you who operate businesses in Florida know we need to keep Florida, Florida. We need to keep Florida from becoming like New York and Illinois and California. 
one of the things that the research is telling us is when we go outside Florida and we talk to site selectors and chief financial officers and CEOs who we're trying to recruit to relocate to Florida, you know, telling them, hey, help us keep Florida, Florida actually backfires because they think we're something that we're not. So um, we're in the middle of an 18 month massive project on this. If you invite me back, you know, in the fall of 22, uh, we will be unveiling, you know, what the business community of Florida hopes is sort of the what do we want Florida to be known as. I mentioned the modeling and simulation industry that I'm sure many of your members are part of. You know, who knew that it's the that we're the global center and capital of modeling and simulation? If you think of the space industry, think of um, Brevard County. You know, in starting in 2023, we'll be launching three rockets a week, right? And you think about what does that mean to the industry? What does that mean for Florida? Um, just there's so many great things about Florida that people don't know from our environment to our infrastructure to our workforce. Um, there's a lot that there's a big story here that we need to tell. And I, I hate to say it, but all of you fall victim to it also, which is, you know, if we're not telling our own story, somebody else will. And Florida has been such a big positive story that hasn't been being told. Um, it's one reason the Wall Street Journal and NPR and Bloomberg, um, you know, I, I don't keep track of it, but the number of calls we're getting, in fact, our chief economist just did a national interview on this just yesterday, where the rest of the country is noticing, hey, Florida's a big winner right now, uh, even a little bit more so than Texas on a lot of measures. And so Florida, you know, we need to keep the momentum going. But my one ask of everybody on this call is, let's not get complacent. You know, my biggest fear is that our business community and our politicians would become uh, apathetic over time and say, wow, at least we're not Illinois and New York and New Jersey and California. Well, that's because we've been working hard for 25 years to be very different from them. But now, you know, when we look at them and say, well, um, hey, at least our pension system's not like Illinois. Well, folks, guess what? Our pension system is $36 billion unfunded in Florida right now. And out of a $95 billion state budget, $1.1 billion is going to buy down the debt on Florida's pension system. I would rather fix the pension system and either give you that money back or let's invest that money in workforce training for the manufacturing industry uh, or in infrastructure for the manufacturing industry. So, uh, again, long answer to a short question, but, um, you know, we're at the point in Florida right now where the answers are easy. The implementation of the answers are often political, which makes them, uh, you know, often pretty difficult. And it's the reason we've all got to band together. So, look, I, I hope everyone will increase your dues and increase your support of the Manufacturing Association of Central Florida. You all are doing great work. And we need an incredibly strong manufacturing association, uh, not just in Central Florida, but all over Florida. Because this literally, if we don't grow this industry, it's going to hold Florida back. And you have my commitment. We'll do anything and everything we can. You just got to let us know what that is. Uh, we have a pretty good line on it right now. We can always do a better job. So thanks for having me. Thank you so Mar much, Mark. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time to speak with our association and appreciate the support of the manufacturing industry. And we definitely look forward to having you back in the future so that we can update on some of these initiatives that that you've discussed and how important those are. Um, again, we will have all these slides and the recording available. It's gonna go out tomorrow in our newsletter along with that very important um, workforce survey that we hope that you guys will take part of. Um, and you can always reach out to us as well if you need more information from Mark. And with that, uh, we're gonna, we're going to sign off today. I hope all of you get a chance to come to our event coming up on April 22nd. It's at Top Golf Lake Mary, and that's, of course, supporting our scholarship program for students uh, looking to have careers in manufacturing. So we know how important that is and how much a lot of you are looking forward to getting out and networking together. So uh, go to our NACF webpage for more updates on that. And uh, we look forward to 
uh, seeing all of you very soon. Uh, thank you again, Mark, and we hope all of you have a great day. Keep on manufacturing.